Hello, everyone. We are live. Pardon me. We had a little muting going on there. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited that you're joining us tonight and that you're here for the very first Century Guild Salon. And um, as it had, was just evidence, we're going to be fine tuning a few things as we go. But um, I'm just so happy that you're all here with us and tuning in tonight. And we are going to be actually discussing infernal creatures this evening. And um, in that same spirit, we just miss having physical events. And we're just trying to recreate what it was like to all be together hanging out in the gallery space. And I just remember one of the things I always enjoyed was hearing Tom talking to people about an artwork or one of the books and sharing his own personal insight to the work. And um, also just interesting anecdotes from his own research that added some depth to the pieces. And um, we're just really excited to be presenting that experience tonight on the internet. And um, I mean, what better way to start than with Halloween month? We've got a book of great artworks. We've got devils and witches and all manner of infernal beings. So on that same note, I will introduce Tom. Hi, Tom. Oh, I can hear you. <laughs> yes, you can. It's a miracle. It's a modern miracle. <laughs> Uh, hi, how are you? Excellent. Why don't you focus <laughs> on infernal creatures? Oh, let me, uh, hang on, let me do my, my share here. I was, uh, I was too caught up in my, in my laughter. <laughs> uh, well, how do you want to start? Why don't you just, uh, start with you know, one of the artworks that just really inspires you, something on a personal level that you really enjoy writing about and researching. <clears throat> um, I mean, I can start with the end papers. The end papers, uh, it is an illustration from 1900 by Carlo Schwab called Destruction. And it's actually an illustration for uh, a poem by Baudelaire. He did an edition of Le Fleur de Mal. Uh, published in 1900, and um, Carlos Schwab, he, he did the poster for the first Salon Rosa Croix, so he was uh, very prominent in the symbolist art movement in Paris uh, in the late 19, or late 1890s, um, and of course Baudelaire being uh, kind of uh, uh, an idol of the symbolists at that time. Uh, it, it's a subject matter that a lot of artists, and you kind of see this in this book, that uh, there really are three uh, editions of Le Fleur de Mal that have really breathtaking uh, symbolist illustrations. And the first of these, uh, of course, published many years after the poems were written, is, is the Carlo Schwab edition. And so the image for destruction you've got these serpents coming out of her nipples and the opium poppies and just kind of her her really bizarre strange gaze with her chin down but the perspective on her eyes are a little bit forward it's just it, it kind of conjures up everything that's great about when you look at the vamps of the silent film era and then trace it back into that femme fatale ideology of the turn of the century. Uh, so yeah, so Carlo Schwab is just someone that I've always been a huge fan of. It's actually one of the reasons that we wound up starting to do San Diego Comic-Con um, probably you know, 18 years ago now. We haven't done it for the last few years, but we had a 14, 15 year run there. Um, and there's an artist named Barry Windsor Smith, uh, who was doing a lot of really spectacular Conan the Barbarian illustrations. And in Bud Plant's art books, he was uh, selling a fantastic book that covered all of Carlo Schwab's work. And the way that he pitched it to people was, if you love Barry Windsor Smith, uh, you'll love Carlo Schwab. And I was looking at that and thinking, God, you know, all this stuff that I deal in, like Carlo Schwab, uh, I came to through this comic art and this fantasy art. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it just made me realize that other people would make that connection. So when I look at this piece, and again, this is just the end papers, we're not even in the book yet. Um, it's just something that, that to me takes what's best about fantasy, uh, art, illustrations, uh, and, and, you know, things that people would call dark art today or things like that. Okay. Forrest wants to know if uh, Carlos Schwab has any relation to Marcel Schwab. I do not know that name. Um, Schwab is, is spelled S-C-H-W-A-B-E. Um, and as far as I know, there are no literary or artistic uh, relatives that have ever come up in any research that I've seen, like not even one of no, but I don't know who this Marcel is. So, uh, as far as I know, the answer is no. I just want to mention very quickly to everyone, if you see anything you have questions about or anything you'd like Tom to elaborate on, please leave us a comment either in the YouTube chat, or if you're on Facebook, just post a comment under the video. And um, Tom will be happy to answer those for you. I don't know if I'll be happy, but I'll do it. Um, so other than the end papers and, and that amazing Carlos Schwab piece, is there another piece in there that's a personal favorite of yours? Um, I mean, do you want me to answer that or do you want me to go on a tangent I just thought of? I could do either one. I was just, well, let me, I'll do both. I'll do both. Go with the muse. Um, these are two more of Carlos Schwab's illustrations for his uh, version of Flowers of Evil, Le Fleur de Mal. And they're just crazy. One of the things that I, I remember being taken with not even just with this book or these artworks in particular, was just that we have such a, a sepia-toned view of the 19th century. And we think about antique art. Oh, it must be like our grandmothers would have and things like that. And then you look at like this stuff and it's just, it's not what most people expect. So one of the things that I really love uh, about what we always did with the gallery and, and, and hopefully now with the salon and crystallized in these books is showing people like just all of this really, really crazy work that was just so connected to all of these weird psychologies of late 19th century. And there's uh, and so then this is the, the image that, that John Lipischak did for our opening credits. This is uh, from 1934 from another edition of Flowers of Evil. Uh, and Manuel Arazzi was a, a really prominent Art Nouveau artist. This was very late in his life. Um, and I don't think that there's, I don't think there's any Lobel Riche in this one. He's really the third. But anyway, it was just kind of me thinking about the, um, you know, just how, oh, here's more, look at that. Oh, like here, this is a great example. Like, look at that. She's got these weird suction cup hair. They're not snakes. They're like, it's like something from like a Guillermo del Toro movie. And she's got that weird suction on the head. That's for uh, a poem called The Albatross. Uh, and then... Here's another Carlos Schwab painting. This was just, uh, this was actually an original painting that we had. It wasn't for anything. Uh, he painted really small, but that was a piece that it's just kind of a, uh, it's a witch ascending a staircase. Uh, and your question was other favorite pieces. <clears throat> um, you know, all of them work together. I'll, I mean, I can stop here just because uh, we're on this page. One of the things I really love about, there's a book uh, by Heisman called Down There, which is a symbolist uh, landmark in a literary sense. And he talks about pulling his carriage up outside of uh, 
La Maison Moderne, I think, is, is where it is, uh, but a venue where he could go in and buy objects like this. So to me, so much of the, the beauty of the era is connected to the fact that, that the artists that were making physical objects were also making things that were so, you know, just kind of strange and <clears throat> distorted and dreamlike and mysterious. And what we tried to do in this book, and of course, these here are just advertising pieces, but, um, you know, it was very much a part of, of the uh, consciousness to be really utilizing mythological ideals. This is a really fun poster. This this is actually the, the poster that made me realize there was more to art than Alphonse Mucha. Uh, I saw this in a book, I think it was called The Poster in History. That's a book, I think, from the 70s. And it's an Italian poster. And if you look at how linear and graphic a lot of Mucha's work is, this is so painterly. So everything that we're looking at here each one of these gradations was a different stone. So it's an entirely different way of thinking about lithographic work. And so the idea here is it's matches without phosphorus. And that uh, it's from the Italian Society for Hygienic Matches Without Phosphorus. <laughs> uh, but the idea that when you would light a match with phosphorus, you had the smell of brimstone, you know, like you had sulfur, so fire and brimstone. And with these new matches, you uh, you don't get that. And so she's kind of just celebrating a new age. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why they did this, but they, the, the reason that phosphorus was such an issue is kids would suck on the matches. I don't know why they would do this, but there was a, a condition that people would get called fossy jaw where your jaw would start to rot out from the buildup of, of phosphorus. Mm. And I remember telling, um, I can't remember what his fake name is, Jackson Public <laughs> from uh, Venture Brothers. I remember talking about this with him and him saying, that sounds like a great name for a character, Fossy Jaw, a guy that's missing his bottom jaw. But so anyway, so that's why uh, hygienic, uh, matches was was a concern in the 19th century, and uh, luckily that's not a an issue now. Well, that's a very practical use of the devil imagery, but around this time there seemed to be, as you mentioned, it was just in the consciousness to use that devilish imagery. Why do you think that was so prevalent at that time? Um. I think that, I think it's always, I think it's always prevalent. <clears throat> I think that the difference is that, like, I'll go back to advertising just, just as an example. The difference is that you had advertising for the first time. Like if you look, mm -hmm. oh, wait, there is an example in here. If you look at what advertising was before the turn of the century, <clears throat> they looked like this. I mean, this is a bad example because it's got artwork on it. But this very, very classical look uh, was kind of the beginning of the art poster. I, there's no example in here of, of what's before this, obviously, but it would have been just text and it would have just said something like, I don't know, buy matches here, you know, uh, I guess you don't know. That's why I'm saying it. I apologize. <laughs> so that, but, it, but it would just be text. And so they started to move into this poster on the left. And then as the lithography got more sophisticated into images like the right. Uh, and so the idea that you would use devils for, you know, again, like this is perfect. You know, he's tempting her with mm -hmm. chocolate. Well, what do you use for temptation? You're going to use a devil because that's, it's an archetype and an illustration that everybody understands immediately. I mean, these are obviously a little bit later. This is more of 20s, 30s style. Um, but even when you look at the earlier posters, 
I mean, these are all magic, so it's kind of a little different. And those are theater. That's a music. I mean, you know, these are, I am not finding an example. Uh, <clears throat> I was looking for something a little more turn of the century. Um, I mean, these are a good example. 1897. Uh, I think it's just the idea of, like in this case, for this ink, uh, that it's a little bit mischievous. You know, if you think about the the idea of writing a letter, of being a, a storyteller, or if you're writing a love note or anything like that, it's you could go two ways with it. You could show something very genteel, or you could show something a little mischievous. And I think it just depends on who your audience is, um, all of those kind of things. And, uh, and same thing here with the uh, same artist, advertising Simplicicamus magazine. Uh, I, you know, they're trying to show that they are a fun magazine. So you've got the devil reading the newspaper and carrying off a redhead, which as you know, as a redhead is a uh, sign of mischief. And you see it a lot in advertising that when a woman is doing something she shouldn't be doing, they would make her a redhead. The idea was that she was a little outside of society and, and it's just symbolism. It's just super basic. And the fact that she's playfully taking his tail to write the name of the magazine. This was a, a German humor magazine in the 1890s. I'm rambling. I can keep going. What, <laughs> what else do you want? Are there any other anything? I love the cheekiness of it. Um, well, I mean, we're on the topic of advertisements. Um, can you comment on the works that were more in the fine art vein versus commercial at this time and and the use of the devil imagery in you know in fine artworks um the main thing like well this 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 isn't the best example the one that's up but th this was heinrich clay was the artist whose works were kind of uh uh, appropriated for Disney's Fantasia. He's a very, very famous German illustrator. Um, his came a little more from a place of whimsy. Uh, I, mean, I think that, let's see where, it could, uh, you know, okay, here's a couple. I guess those aren't devilish. We'll go back to the underworld. Uh, um, Franz von Stuck was known as the Prince of Painters. Um, he was, uh, one of the, the, he definitely was coming up before symbolism was a thing. So he was extremely rooted in classicism The I think that it really all comes back to symbolism. It's the idea of, if you're trying to tell a story, like for example, if you want to paint suffering, well, how do you do that? You know, you can paint someone uh sitting and crying or what does that feel like well then you start to get into the internal landscapes and so with something like in the underworld like this artwork uh what is hell you know hell is suffering that's a, that is a state of being that is a uh a living um a living situation that's extremely unpleasant so when you look at like that like that is not a pleasant face. That is not someone. Look at that face. Wait, hold on. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. He's got his head on a breast. Do you think he'd be having a good time? But no. Look at where he is. He's in hell. He's suffering. You know, everyone. And then of course, there's the tempter, right? There's Satan, who's the only person. And then look at the snake's almost smiling, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a little, this is an engraving based on a painting, a beautiful painting. Uh, and Franz von Stuck is the artist who created this painting, Sin. Um, he was, uh, I mean, I don't want to get too far off on a Franz von Stuck tangent, but he, he did a lot of, of work that was really, he was extremely celebrated in, in Germany uh, very, very rooted in classical symbolism. And then to the right, <clears throat> it's kind of a little interesting 
variant, which is Georges de Fure, he was one of the quintessential Art Nouveau artists. His line work is absolutely on par with Mucha. And his earlier work, like this one, this is a few years before he was doing the really prime Art Nouveau things, was very uh, Japanese. He was one of the French that were very influenced by that. And so uh, the he did a beautiful Flowers of Evil artwork that's kind of in this manner. And this artwork is titled Friends of Devil in the Flesh. And so the ideas of uh, depicting witchcraft in ways that were meant to inspire different conversations than just, hey, it's a witch on a broomstick, uh, is another thing that, that was really beautifully prominent at that time. Um, and again, he was studying Japanese art and trying to do kind of the French take on it. That's why you've got this Western idea of the woman with the cauldron, but you've got the strange spirit in the background and mm -hmm. a bunny that looks, uh, I mean, you know, I think that's supposed to be Satan, but I'm not sure, to be honest. Well, in, in this particular artwork, you have those examples, but can you explain a little bit as to what Japanism was and, and the hold it had on French artwork around this time? Well, <clears throat> you know, especially with the internet, we think of everything as a global culture, but you had prior to 19, 19, prior to 1858, I forget what century I'm in, prior to 1858, uh, everything uh, was, the borders were very closed. And so Japan had closed borders. They were just coming out of the samurai era. It seems like it's centuries ago, but it's not that long ago. And so in 1858, uh, the BJ restoration happened and it was a political movement where they opened their borders to trade with the rest of the world. So what happened at that time is then there was a massive influx of goods from Japan coming into Europe. And so in France, you would have, uh, you know, pottery and things like that, that would be coming and it would be wrapped in what to the Japanese were throwaway pieces of paper that today we would look at and say, oh, that's Hokusai's the wave or these mm -hmm. things that are incredibly powerful graphics that they, you know, and, and hand watercolored and, you know, whatever processes that they were using that were pretty much throwaway, not to mention all the objects, fabrics, furniture. But so it was very, very enticing uh, and foreign in an alien way, like in that, in literally the, the sensibility being alien. If you think about when you look at Europe and you've got furniture and it's like Louis XIV, Louis XV, Louis the, like everything is kind of just like a slight variation and then out of nowhere, is a completely different aesthetic sensibility. So when you look at artists like Toulouse Lautrec, he was a Japanist. He's kind of the best known Japanist. And so here, the best example is well, here's a perfect example. Look at these brush strokes. Like that is so traditional. And then now look at this modeling. Look at how this part here looks. We think of it as contemporary comic art or things like that. But look at the splatter techniques onto the lithographic stones. These flat, look at how there's no depth to that leaf. And you can see through it to see the background. It's like a design element. Like those things didn't exist in European art prior to the BJ restoration. Sorry, it was a long tangent. But yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's Japanism. No, it's, it's great to see that kind of, you know, origin material to what is so prevalent today in comic see, art. Look, like look at how, this looks like it could be from the 15th century, right? Both of these. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's classical. It looks like it could be, you could see this in like Game of Thrones or something. And then you look at that one on the right and it's like, what is going on there? It's so strange. And that's directly what led to artists like Muka, like his Gizmonda poster, the big vertical poster, uh, was directly inspired by Japanese artworks. Like he was a devout Japanist. 
Well, Jen comments that she thinks that might be a goat, not a bunny in the Georges de Fure piece. Uh, whatever it is, it looks uh, like something I do not want to see at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, there it is. Yeah, I mean, it looks like they could be, I don't know. To be honest, I really, the reason I never studied this piece is because he never wrote about it. And I'm also not, like when you start getting into Japanism, um, it, uh, there's a lot of la symbolist language there that I, I just don't personally have. But yeah, I wonder, I don't know. It could be, it could be, I don't know. We'll have to have some animal people have that debate. <laughs> Are there any pieces in here that you personally couldn't bring yourself to sell? Or if you sold it already, maybe you wish you hadn't? Uh, well, this is one that Chandra would not let us sell. And uh, gosh, let me think if I go through this. Um, I mean, there are pieces, you know, like I still have this witch piece just because it 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 kind of means a lot to me as an early piece that I had. I missed this one. I sold this to a very, very, very nice man. Because, uh, you know, there's just only so many objects you can have around, but that that's a great one. Um, I mean, you know, they're all really cool. I'm trying to think of if there's a favorite. I mean, the match poster on the right, there means a lot to me. Of course, that one I love. This might be the one. You know, when you when you have a gallery, you have to you have to buy and sell things. It's just how you keep things moving. But this was uh, so delicate and so beautiful. It it can't translate in print. Uh, and I definitely miss that one. Um, I mean, they're all so cool. I mean, this is, this might, let me go through real quick. I'm sorry. I'll pick a couple of favorites. Okay. I know which ones to talk about. The, this is a great one. This, of well, I'm, I'll do that one later. <clears throat> this might be. That might be my favorite one in here. And I, I like both of these. They're so strong. But the reason I think I like this one is because it's a little less obvious. And it's it's a lot more complicated in its symbolism. And I love the way it's lithographed. And, and you've got this really unhealthy green with this really acidic orange. And Hans Heinz yours is, is I, I would compare him to H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, he is an author that most Americans don't know, but he was uh, a late 19th century author that wrote really, really disturbing metaphysical tales. There's a movie, an American movie, and I don't remember when it was from, but called The Bad Seed. And the idea was that this, you know, kid was made in a laboratory and uh, the origin of that is the story of Alron. And so the idea was <clears throat> that if you took uh, a mandrake root and planted it uh, underneath uh, a hanging tree, that if a man was hung there and his semen then uh, reached the mandrake root that it would create a living creature. And so the idea of this story is that this beautiful, beautiful child named Alron that grew from a mandrake root, that's what that is, uh, he created her in a test tube. And I don't know if they used like, 
I don't know if they specifically used the semen of the hand. I think they did. I think they did in the story that it was a of a of a murderer and that he created her in lab. But the point is that Professor Ten Brinken made this girl. And then as she grew up, she just left a trail of death and destruction and broken hearts in her wake. So the idea is that she was, uh, it was nature versus nurture. Like, are you inherently evil from the beginning? And I feel like an element of the story is, would she have been evil if she didn't find out? Like, these are the things that are, it's not attempting to answer the debate, but uh, it's just a great 19th century, bizarre, metaphysical, Lovecraftian story. And they made uh, three film versions of it as all raw and one with Brigitte Helm. Um, and then, of course, the story has been appropriated. The Bad Seed is one. And then there was another one that I feel like starred William Shatner that was another interpretation of that but i'm now i'm starting to think about things that i don't know about but anyway yeah so that that might be like one of the ones that just was never i never even considered selling it just because it's and it's rare it might be the only known copy if, if there's five copies between museums and everything in the world then i would be shocked but it's it's just a rare austrian poster from 1918 that Great design, great symbolism, great subject matter, great text, and a fantastic artist, Taylor Mateko, is outstanding. I'm going to keep talking until you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Did you interrupt me? I don't know. Better. Well, I wanted to ask you, you'd mentioned the, the more metaphysical pieces, and then we've seen some that are obviously very cheeky and on the more whimsical side. Um, but I feel like we've only kind of scratched the surface on symbolism and, and what that really meant in art and, and mysticism at the time and how that was fueling the works in Paris, particularly at least. Um, what works? Because I'm not 100% sure I understand. You said and fueling the works in Paris. Do you mean advertising or in the fine art world or, or just culturally or what? Well, culturally, but can you give us some, some examples of symbolist works that that you feel embody the symbolist movement and um, what it means to have that metaphysical subject matter in an artwork? Um, I think that the biggest the biggest misconception about symbolist art is the idea that it has to have uh, a witch or a devil or, or things like that. So just to back the camera up a little bit, to look at it a little more broadly, um, the biggest element of symbolism is the idea that it's like that, um, you know, there's a Neil Gaiman line that I love that, uh, and I just said this on Chet Sauer's podcast this week, which is why it's in my head, that a story need not have happened to be true. And there's another uh, great line from The Little Prince by Yupre that, that says, uh, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And so whenever you're using anything, whether it's in this case, the mask of tragedy, or if we're looking at, you know, in here, the fact that you've got hell and a serpent, um, the point of symbolism is that it's attempting to illuminate an internal landscape utilizing visuals and, and it's, uh, especially trying to make understandable the inarticulatable, inarticulable, inarticulatable. And so this piece on the left here is Franz von Stuck. It's called Sin. And so the idea that you've just got the hint of nipples here and that you've got that she's just completely in cahoots with this serpent. But she's not looking. I mean, it's it's not. She's not vamped up. She's confident. She's very strong. Um, this is 
probably von Stuck's most famous painting. He he did multiple versions of it because he sold it and someone said they wanted one. And so then he did another. So I think he did three versions. There could be more, but, but there's three I know of in museums, um, including one in Seattle at the Fry Museum. But the idea that you've got this just unreasonable size snake like that's not that's not a pet snake you know that she's got this um uh you know she's she's completely wrapped in it like a cloak and the idea that it is kind of this biblical representation of sin and that she's got this femme fatale energy but it's not femme fatale in that crime noir way. Like it's, it's, uh, it is, it's very confident, very strong. It, you could talk, I mean, people have written books just about this painting alone, I'm sure. So it's, um, the main thing for symbolism is that it's illuminating an internal landscape use, using visuals. And that when you see things like the serpent of Eden, when you see, uh, things like, um, you know, in this case, the, you know, which Circe, or if you see in this particular case here, hell, it's, it's, it's a shortcut for the viewer to ramp onto the highway of, of what the artist is trying to drive you towards. Does that make sense? Definitely. What was what was the first piece that you ever had in your collection from this book? Um, well, uh, the very, 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 very first piece that Century Guild ever owned is this pre-Raphaelite poster. Uh, that was... That was the very, yeah, that was it. That was a very, back in 1999, that was the first piece uh, that that I ever bought as an art dealer. Can you tell us about a pre-Raphaelite collection? Um, it, W.G. Robinson is not an artist that I really know anything about. He was kind of part of a school of British illustrators that was working at the time. And, and he didn't do a lot of poster art. My interest in this was more about the event. Uh, it's 1897. So it's very late for the pre-Raphaelite movement. Uh, but it was an exhibition of, of their paintings that was taking place. And, uh, you know, it was, it's just kind of like the perfect blend of art nouveau graphics with, um, you know, you've got the artist as a muse here with this illuminating crystal ball. And if you start getting into floral symbolism, you've got the lilies that represent uh, purity. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's not a lot that I know actually specifically about this because my head's not in it. I probably knew at one point what each of these represented but i would be stammering trying to remember right now but anyway that was it that was the first piece very cool well we have a fan of the mysteries of freemasonry poster in the book is there more to that story the um yeah that's i was looking at that earlier thinking that's a good one to talk about it's uh so everything that's in this book are pieces that we've had in exhibitions and shows. And when we started doing these books, the idea was, okay, well, what's the greatest hits? So this is like, oh, okay, what's Satan's greatest hits? And so it's Flowers of Evil and German cabaret sheet music and magazines from, this one's from 1920, uh, that have kind of this, like, this is like satanic, whoops, satanic mass kind of thing and this is in one of our orchid garden books too i don't remember what issue or what, what what book that's in but um 
where is, did I pass it? Or is it still coming? Here it is. The Freemasonry poster is, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely one of my, that's one of the all-time favorites in there. It's uh, the Mysteries of Freemasonry. So Leo Taxil was, was uh, if, if anybody looks him up on the internet, he's best known as a hoaxer. Leo Taxil is the person that wrote this book, The Mysteries of of, of the Freemasons. Um, and what he did is he wrote all of these books that were denouncing uh, the Catholic Church, especially like mistresses of the Pope and the debaucheries of the confessor. And they're like these S&M posters from the 1880s. And they were extremely uh, graphic attempts at uh, unveiling the clergy as lecherous and sadistic and uh you know certainly something that a hundred years later we we know is truer than they might have wanted to admit publicly back in the 1880s but so he was just really outing a lot of negative behavior writing these horrible horrible uh books and then he uh at one point said i'm a changed man i was wrong i have taken this like you you couldn't take this guy any further the posters specifically are so graphic so gruesome and he just does a complete 180 and he asked for forgiveness and started working with a medium that was giving him all of this stuff that was supposedly coming from heaven. And so he started writing all of these extremely spiritually positive books. And, um, and it reached a point where he got an audience with the Pope and the Pope uh, and the other clergymen were like, we are not shaking hands with that guy. But he, he became so prominent in the pro Catholic literary field that he he achieved an audience with the pope and then he held a press conference uh to say that he was just kidding he just wanted to see if he could get the pope to shake his hand and the military had to escort him out of paris because the uh religious people were so furious so one of leo taxiel's most popular books is this Mysteries of Freemasonry, Masonry, where he uh, supposedly unveils all of the secrets of the Masonic lodges and their uh, their uh, affiliations with Baphomet. Mm. Big hoaxer. Yeah, that's the well. I mean, yeah, that's why people know who he is. It's not so. The, the main thing of this is this is not a poster. Like, oh, it's for the Church of Satan. It's for this book by this man who in the 1880s was, uh, I mean, he was, he was, it was like jackass. Like he literally did the most grotesque things literally that you could do to the church and then did a 180, got the Pope to celebrate him and then did a 180 again and said, yeah, I was totally just screwing with you. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to admire his marketing skills. <laughs> I, they ran him out of town, so I don't know. I don't know how well his marketing skills. He he literally did have a military escort. Wow. Do you have any other questions about any of the... Uh, well, here's... This is another interesting religious piece. Uh, this one here, I, I think, is super interesting. Uh, you know, you've got everybody praying... And then it's like, but what's above it? Oh, the artist did it, that did this did a series of plates called War, um, and it was just kind of uh, he was it was during World War One, and he was obviously just trying to call out the hypocrisy of you know the religious people calling for bombs to be dropped on their enemies, kind of thing. Well, we've gone through a lot of historical works, and I know there are a lot of really visually amazing, more 
contemporary posters in here as well. Can you show us some of those? I know we've got some film posters and whatnot. Uh, I have to be honest, I wasn't listening. I got distracted. <laughs> we had a more pertinent question. I by this one. Yeah, because <laughs> that's okay. I saw that get sent over. And I, I mean, so this is um this is this is a this is a, a hard one for me to to get uh to be really sure about a lot of things on it. I can understand it in a general sense. So this was from a series uh called Allegorian that was printed between 1895 and 1900. And the idea was uh, that all of the greatest artists that were these young up and coming artists like Gustav Klimt and Karl Otto Cheska and Kalem and Moser, all of the artists that formed the Vienna Secession all met working on this series. Uh, the publisher was a well-respected publisher and uh, they all wanted to work with him and he just created a great community around it. And so Hans, Hans Freiger, is, is not an artist that, that achieved any fame, but he did create one of the most powerful images in the entire series. And um, the, the key is in the title, which is The Hunt. Because normally, yeah, you would look at this and it's like, okay, you've got this Buddha imagery, you've got, I'm not completely sure if the figure on his right is meant to be kind of like an Ishtar, you've obviously got death on his left. Um, but the person on the far left that's kind of got like a Japanese uh, mythological look to them in the crutch, like I'm not sure what that means. But what you do have, like what I, I do know is just when you're looking at it, you've got uh, all of these people being kind of swept up as, as victims of commerce. And so something that, that is, is relevant to this on a chronological sense is this is right after the Industrial Revolution. And the reason that we even have Art Nouveau is because the artists were reacting to the idea that industrialization was going to ruin our society. And so when you look at the factory that's in the background, we take that for granted, big factories like that. That did not exist in 1895. And so I saw the comment come up, like, is it life or death? Like, I would say that, uh, I would say yes. I would say that what, he's trying to do here is making the point that by pursuing these material goods, uh, I mean, in a cliche way, pursuing the material goods, you know, you've got, you've got industry and commerce that you're losing life. But I think that there's another element to this, um, which might be a little more critical, something that was really, really prominent in German illustration at this time were, uh, everything like this um, was very highly politically charged. I shouldn't say everything, but I mean like a lot of this kind of material was. And so I do think that um, the idea that spiritualism is becoming corrupt is probably a big element of it. Um, I'll also be honest, one of the reasons I've never really done more to decipher this one is because it's so dark and so intense and so powerful to me that I feel like I understand it on that gut level. Um, and yeah, pollution, like, so the, the whole point with, with the Art Nouveau um, movement is that they, they thought that these factories that were coming in were going to completely ruin everything like life as they knew it they had no idea uh how 
overdeveloped the world was going to become. Um, I would be interested to see how big factories were getting in the 1890s. Because like that factory in the background has to be an anomaly that can't have been um, as omnipresent as certainly as things like that are today. But yeah, so I, I think that, that the beautiful thing about not just symbolist art, but about artists like this and about the artists that were working in Allegorian is I really don't think you're supposed to get it quickly. I think that that the idea is that you're supposed to, if it's, uh, um, it is kind of that Masonic idea, which is if you put it right out there, then people aren't doing the work to understand it. And it's through doing the work to understand it that you have a, like a really meaningful relationship with it. But yeah, I mean, I love it. It's it's very, it's very strange and very, um, you know, it's it's definitely inspiring me to think about it more. But yeah, it's it's a really powerful work. I don't know, uh, you know. So I, I I see the forest is asking about Marxism. <clears throat> there was a, a huge, huge issue. Uh, with um, the anarchist movement at this time, you had the uh, the workers with the you know the little caps and and the idea of of as um, you know communism Marxism. I'm not I'm not sure where those things are converging in uh, the 1890s, but. I don't know if this artwork is speaking directly to that, but Forrest, you are uh, accurate in in the sense of that it was an issue at this time. I wish that the the um, the Mask of Anarchy poster isn't in this book, is it? I don't. It's not. I, so. I mean, that's that's you know just some powerful Art Nouveau uh, thing trying to paint the anarchists as boogeymen. Um, well, let me ask you, Leslie wants to know why Buddhism was chosen as opposed to Christianity to represent spiritualism in the Schweiger artwork. I don't, this, this kind of, I mean, I, on this work, I don't know because it's such a distorted, it's such a distorted Buddha. I'm not even sure if that's exactly who it's supposed to be um and uh, there are works that i've done a ton of research on and can can definitely point obviously like with the la pater book like to really specific mm -hmm. things uh but on this one I, I i'm embarrassed to say that i just kind of have like a you know a very cursory uh per perception of who these are like it's entirely possible and and i'll you know I'll, actually i'll do some research on this that you know there's more representation here than just spirituality the reason that i i feel like there's some spiritual element is like you know this the female figure for example like that's very clearly some kind of um i mean she's representing something uh classical that is not uh like part of you know any christian tradition you know and as to whether or not they could or couldn't mock christianity uh artists did it they certainly got in trouble for it um when muka well it depends on the country like in paris uh i don't know about the mockery but but definitely avant-garde forms of thinking were celebrated. It was talked about in cafes, like the, the challenges weren't as uh, as offensive as, it was probably a lot like today. You could do it in, uh, you can certainly do it in New York and Los Angeles, but maybe not Houston. <laughs> right. Well, I'm interested in digging into some of the film posters. There you go. So what what was the cause of this influx in occult imagery in the 70s? 
Oh my God. Uh, I, you know, I mean, it's, I, it's kind of like when you have a lot of Westerns and, uh, you know, the, the tide turned in the sixties with all the great hammer horror films and things like that. Like you just, you had a, a big run of great horror films. And I think in the fifties, things were a little more, I don't want to say science-based, but, you know, I feel like science fiction might've been a little stronger in the fifties. Um, and it's, it's kind of pre satanic panic. I mean, all of the posters that we've got in here are things that are from 62 to 1975 or something. Uh, and yet they're, you know, I mean, they're very campy and, you know, the witchcraft 70 is just a documentary on you. You had a huge resurgence. I collect a lot of magazines with these and you definitely see it picking up in the late sixties and it could be connected to some of the hippie uh, stuff uh the dangerous hippies um or is mentioning the manson family yeah i mean the idea that you know it's uh kind of libidinous or how you say the word where you know they're naked and they're performing sex and it's satanism you know like i could see that kind of becoming very titillating i mean probably the the coolest ones to me are these ones that are just for quite possibly some of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. Um, Philippe Drouillet, the, the artist, was, I don't know, like art director slash actor in these super, super low budget films. Um, and this one is hilarious. Uh, the two cent version is just that they, you got, they filmed a short and the guy liked it so much he gave him more money so they just continue the story and it's a completely different like the story makes sense and ends and then it just all of a sudden picks up and it's kind of like the after credit scene being an hour of a, of a short film so it's really absurd and ends with like machine guns and makes no sense whatsoever but the art is just so quintessential i mean look at that it's yeah, right. it the Art Nouveau inspiration. Oh my, well, I mean, you know, psychedelic rock posters, it was all coming into resurgence at this time, but like the border with the skulls and, um, you know, these are the movies that you want so desperately to be as cool as the poster. And uh, it just does not, unfortunately, happen. <laughs> well, let me ask you, There, there is, of course, a camp element to these but what makes them so hold up so well in the gallery setting alongside the historical artworks? That's a really good question. Um, God, that's a really good question. Cause I think about this a lot. Um, it's, you know, there's, um, I was talking about this with, with Chet Zar after we finished his podcast today and we were talking about some artists and we were talking about like, you know, the autism spectrum and things like that. And I was thinking about one of the things that I used to do, is it like part of how I came up in the business was like, there'd be three vases and I would have to say, this is the one like that a museum collection should have. Mm -hmm. And then we would do the research on all of them and it would, always pan out that the one that I had picked was the one that really kind of proved to be the historically significant one. And I'm, I'm not sure what I've, I've heard other people talk about this, like Tom Waits talks about sounds like, like a hand moving on a sheet is a fingernails on a chalkboard to him. And so one of the things is that there's, um, there, the thing that makes a work really great, in my opinion, and in, 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 in the practice that I've had for the, the past decades, is that um, the, there's a consistency to the vision. 
And so the thing that I notice in 99.999% of the work that, that I see is that there's a faltering at some point. There's, a, there's some small inconsistency. And so when you look at like, say, I'm just going to say comic book art, because this is where I notice it a lot. When I look at someone like Adam Hughes, who does like the good girl pin up stuff version of Mooka, and a lot of people would say, well, why out of the people that are trying to do Art Nouveau, do you think, why do you like his work? And for me, when I look at his work, there is just a complete consistency of hand there. Mm -hmm. It is the exact same thing that like, if you show me a Mooka sketch that's fake, I can tell you it's fake. Like there's just a consistency that's always there. And so when you're looking at work and it doesn't matter if it's from 2020 or 1970 or, or 1820 or any of that, the thing that really makes a work great to me is when I can perceive that the artist has gone so far into their personal style that even if they started off copying someone else or, or whatever, that there is no mistaking if they drew a smiley face on a napkin. And it's not like I'm saying that people need to be locked in. But it's just when you see that consistency, when you look at every inch of, of an image, and in this case, this goofy, campy poster, every millimeter of this, I see Philippe Drouillet, every mm -hmm. millimeter. And so there are people, I'm sure, that tried to do this style that I might say, they were, they're like not 100% there. And, you know, of course, he became very, very famous in the world of French comics and his art is very valuable and all of that. But I didn't know that when I saw this, I just knew when I was looking at it, that there's a consistency to his vision that, that translates. And so it'll happen that I like a lot of things that, that people might not think that I would like. There's, there's, there's some Instagram artists that I see where there's, there's a lot that I see where I, I see that they could get there with the work. But there's even more where I look and, um, and yeah, they've just like, I can tell that they've made that step internally where they've done the practice with their hand so that, that this is maybe the way to put it. The distance between the eye and the hand uh, or the heart and the hand seems non-existent to me. And so if it's Gustav Klimt or if it's one of these goofy posters or, I mean, certainly that's not the case with these. These are a little just more campy and weird. Here, these are the ones I had up. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. Like Hans Schweiger, this is a great example. He's not famous, but he's extraordinary. And not all the best artists are famous. Um, but yeah, so that's, so the reason that I carried it all the way through to the seventies stuff is because when it came to the things that we've had in the gallery that fell under what I would say are infernal creatures, these were the, the last, you know, of the vintage work when you get into the seventies and, and of course there's, there's artworks like this is just a graphic design thing. I mean, it's just. You know, it's crazy. It's weird. It's campy. But I do think that, you know, I mean, look, look at this. Look at how secessionist that face is. He just nailed it. Like, it's it's right there. It's perfect. It's great. And then, uh, you know, I mean, these were carved in 1883. And they're masterful. This, I didn't, I forgot these were in there. There's Gail Pataki in an exhibition that we had at the gallery with Schnackenberg and the Berlioz poster and then uh, some advertisements. And then the book ends with uh, a little iridescent Art Nouveau cat that we had uh, in the case. You gotta have a cat in there. You gotta have a cat. Oh, wait, you gotta have a cat handler in there. 
absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm sure that you and I and maybe three other people could go on for another few hours dissecting I, I everything. Mean, I, uh, yeah, that is true. I can <laughs> ramble. I ramble really well. So I'm glad that I got the high sign that it's been an hour and, um, and next month we'll talk about the opposite. Well, not the opposite, but we'll talk about very pretty things because we'll talk about uh, flowering lines. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be, uh, yeah, that'll be be beautiful floral imagery and, uh, you know, a lot of advertising work and, uh, and the ways that nature was used in advertising and the symbolism there. Yes, definitely. And I wanted to share with you all that we have a new book on Kickstarter right now. And if you enjoyed the works in Infernal Creatures, um, I think you'd really enjoy the works in Bitter Blossoms. It reprints artworks from 1921 from a German magazine called The Orchid Garden. So there's just a lot of, you know, it ranges from sexy to very spooky to eccentric and it's the predecessor to Weird Tales. So I just pulled up that magazine cover if you want to show it. Sure. So this magazine on the right, De Orchidine Garden, um, it was, it, as Kat said, it was a predecessor to Weird Tales. It reprinted stories by artists like yours who did that all wrong uh, story. And it's, it's a lot of it is really impossible to describe in Western terms, because it's a lot of like Eastern European, like there's one story in one of the magazines where these guys are all sitting around a table talking about what would be the best way to die. And they're coming up with their elaborate schemes. And then one guy chokes and falls over at the table. And then the story just ends that they're all jealous that he died. It's so weird and dark and it's just like very, very comical and very humorous and very bleak. And uh, the author who invented the term robot, his name is escaping me, was a writer that would be in these. It was a Russian artist, a Russian writer. And so the literature is, is a lot of things that people aren't familiar with, but even more importantly were the images that illustrated them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's this is incredibly interesting and, and fascinating magazine and we've done uh some of the stories have been reprinted in english but the images have never been reprinted anywhere and so we've been scanning uh and photographing and documenting and i've been tracking down obscure biographies on the artists written by like in one case someone's daughter wrote and published like a hundred copies of this thing so we're finding this great information um and reprinting every illustration and we're we've done how many six so far or five we have done six and we are moving on to number seven which is on kickstarter right now okay yeah so there'll be eight in total uh and some of the art is whimsical some of it is grotesque uh it's more illustrative than this uh then this book, this has a lot of, uh, you know, paintings and color graphics, and that's more line art. Uh, there's some people in the, in the chat saying the robot word. I'm not going to try to say that name because I know that I will say it incorrectly. But yes, that is the author. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, like Russian, Czechoslovakian, German, Austrian, and there's so many great artists that when you start to get into their body of work, it's really beautiful and fantastic. And, and I would say that it's, um, you know, if you're interested in, in Lovecraft and you're interested in like the Edgar Allan Poe kind of horror stories, and if you can take those with an element of the grotesque and the humorous, then you're going to love the Orchid Garden. Definitely. And you can check out Bitter Blossoms on Kickstarter by searching Bitter Blossoms on Kickstarter. <laughs> and, <laughs> very simple. And um, I also just want to remind you guys, subscribe to our YouTube channel because we will be having the salon the first Thursday of every month and you'll be notified when we go live. And as Tom was saying, our topic next month is going to be flowering lines. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, the, the idea is, and I know Kat said this at the beginning, but um, one of the fun things about the gallery was that you actually got to talk to people. And we, we've really, obviously, as anyone who's been familiar with the company, especially for the last 20 years, is we've shifted heavily into the publishing. I loved doing the exhibitions, but when you do an exhibition, you can show it to a few hundred people. And when you do a book, it's permanent. It's out there. It's in the world. You can share it. You can uh, talk about it. And so the idea behind these is just that every month we'll pick a different book um, and we'll talk about it. We did pick one that is probably the one that I knew the least about. <laughs> so I, I did answer a lot of questions with, I don't know, but, uh, and we'll do that for the next couple of months. And then I think in January or February, we'll do Le Pater and, um, we might do a couple interview things, but this was obviously the first time that we're doing this. So if you learned anything or had fun, uh, please tell other people. And we're just trying to figure out how to, uh, figuring out what a gallery looks like in the 21st century. And, and the first step for us was, uh, we'd like to get back to physical exhibitions at some point, but the, the more important thing by far to me um, is taking the stories uh, that I know and the information that I have about these artworks and just putting them down in writing so that they can be passed around and and will be there after I'm gone for the next generation of researcher. So on my end, thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, I don't know what else you want to say, Kat. Thank you, Tom. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us for the first salon. I really hope you guys come and comment next month and um, we will and be posting Kat for being a wonderful hostess. And thank you to Chandra for uh, hiding in the background and uh, being our, our technology moderator. Yes. Thank you. Which includes knocking on the door to tell you when that your microphone is off. She is a <laughs> miracle worker. Yes. So thank you for bearing with me as I work out the kinks on my end. But um, I also wanted to mention if you are interested in getting a copy of Infernal Creatures, um, we will be posting the description um, below and you'll be able to um, order it on centuryguild.net. And with that, thank you again, everybody, for joining thank us. You. Thanks to everybody for being here. And hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll see you guys next month, first Thursday. Yes, thank you.